Hello, and welcome to worship at Northminster Church today. It's so good to be together from near or far, and we welcome you all, whether you've been here for generations or whether you just stumbled across us looking through Facebook for that new sourdough bread recipe. We're so glad you're here, and you're all welcome. Thank you for worshiping with us today. We light this Christ candle as a symbol of Christ in our lives, whose light and love guides us in the creativity of our faith to explore new avenues, to develop a caring community, to envision a world of peace and freedom. As is our custom, we also acknowledge in a moment of gratitude that we live, work, worship and play on Treaty 7 land. I invite you now to watch this Threshold Moment video to more deeply prepare our hearts and minds for worship. All things are beautiful, not by a standard of pretty as seen by our eyes, but by an essence of sacred worth that is sensed by the Spirit. This is the root and heart of compassion and justice. Beauty is the threshold to divine goodness and a door into radical compassion. Contemplation trains our spirits to see this deeper truth. Over the next six weeks, we will pursue a contemplative life to deepen our spiritual capacities so that we might live as beloveds of God who extend goodness in the world. from us. 
Now for our opening prayer. Let us pray. Divine goodness, Holy One, pause for us this moment, bear us up in this time, hold us for eternity. We offer ourselves in connection with you. We allow ourselves this love from you. We release ourselves into your presence. And all the people say, Amen. Look to Assyria, once a Lebanon cedar. Beautiful branches, dense shade, towering height. It is top among the clouds. Springs nourished it, and deep waters made it grow tall. Their streams flowed around its base, sending their channels to all the trees in the countryside. So it towered high above every other tree of the field. Its boughs grew larger and its branches extended out, nourished by an abundance of water. All the birds of the air nested in its boughs. Under its branches, wild animals gave birth to their young. All the great nations thrived in its shade. It was majestic in its beauty, with its spreading boughs, its roots reaching deeply into an abundance of water. This is the first in um, the Marsha McPhee series, Beguiled by Beauty, Cultivating a Life of Contemplation and Compassion. Dr. McPhee, if you'll recall, was the author of our last two Advent series and our last Lenten series. And she always provides a thoughtful and thought-provoking framework of suggested readings and music on, what, on which to build a meaningful worship experience and I hope this is gonna be one of those. When I was informed that we could use more volunteers to assist with the summer services, I acquiesced and I said, all right, I'll do it. And then I started to read the material and the more I read, the more I thought, what was I thinking? How am I gonna, this is pretty deep stuff. Um, but then the more I read and pondered and thought, I thought, okay, I can do this. But more importantly, I thought we can do this. And so week one of Beguiled by Beauty, Beauty, Contemplation, and Radical Compassion. So, if your source of information and experience were to only come from the media, undoubtedly you would think we were surrounded by nothing but ugliness, ugly disturbing visuals of people in conflict, hateful, mean-spirited, ignorant, in the true sense of the word, opinions shared in print and social media. How can we possibly speak of beauty, let alone beguiled, charmed, or enchanted by it? And how can we look past the ugliness? Or even more importantly, and maybe even more impossible, it would seem, how can we see beauty amidst the ugliness? Let's look back at that reading from Ezekiel. There's this beautiful cedar tree spreading its branches to provide nests for the birds, shelter and safety for the animals, and in its majestic beauty, to provide shade for all the great nations. In this reading, we're invited to, in the words of Professor Ali Utley, meditate on the, majestic, on the majesty rather, of nature. Well, that all sounds easy enough. However, our view of beauty is constantly being influenced by the media. And even they change their mind from fashion cycle to fashion cycle. Even the expression, beauty is only skin deep, could easily be misinterpreted that it's only being beautiful on the outside that counts. And in the millions of dollars that are spent on makeup and elective cosmetic surgery, well, they do nothing to belie that thought. The other one we hear all the time is, it's what's inside that counts, which is of course absolutely true. But in my teenaged mind, I always hear it being prefaced with, never mind, and making it seem to be valued as a distant second 
to having a Kardashian exterior. But unlike us, who could easily be conditioned to view beauty as an external only and to respond to people accordingly, God sees us in our entirety, inside and out. In her discussion with Marsha McPhee, Dr. Wendy Farley talks about how God views the world and how he delights in it, is beguiled by it. Our recognition of the beauty around us, not just the obvious, the, su the stunning sunset or the first robin of spring, that recognition, she says, is a link between the human spirit and the divine goodness that is God. And she uses the example of the creation story in Genesis. God saw everything that he made and said, behold, it is very good. God was entranced by what he had created. He was the project manager. He could have constructed the world any way he wanted, but he chose to include the platypus with the swan. And he was very pleased with what he had done. There was no need for gratuitous superlatives. It was very good and he loved it. And he didn't spend the seventh day upgrading it or tweaking it. He rested, content in the goodness of his creation. He was beguiled by his beauty. So, how are we to recognize the beauty around us and see the world as God sees it? Lest we're tempted to throw in the towel already, thinking this is an impossible task, I ask you, when you describe someone you love, a family member, a friend, do you start off by saying, well, they're tall, they have brown eyes, they dress really nicely? No, you say, they're just lovely, so kind, so thoughtful, so funny. Nothing to do with externals. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, not so much seeing with the eyes, as seeing with the spirit. Through prayer and contemplation, we can develop that sixth sense, not being able to see dead people, of sensing with the spirit. So how do we move towards sensing with the spirit? There are many avenues of contemplation, meditation, prayer, and innumerable writ books written on the subject of how to achieve a contemplative lifestyle. C.S. Lewis wrote a book in 1942, The Screwtape Letters, a series of letters from a senior devil, Screwtape, to his nephew Wormwood, a devil in training, mentoring him on how to secure the damnation of a particular soul, referred to only as the patient. C.S. Lewis speaks indirectly to the importance of contemplation. My dear Wormwood, he writes, be sure that the patient maintains completely fixed on politics, arguments, political gossip, and obsessed with the faults of people that they've never met serves as an excellent distraction from advancing in personal virtue, character, and the things the patient can control. Make sure to keep the patient in a constant state of angst, frustration, and general disdain towards the rest of the human race in order to avoid any kind of charity or inner peace from further developing. Ensure the patient continues to believe that the problem is out there in the broken system, rather than recognizing that there's a problem with himself. Keep up the good work, Uncle Screwtape. Sound familiar? In another passage, Lewis writes, it's funny how mortals always picture us putting things into their minds. In reality, our best work is done by keeping things out. Not to minimize anything, the journey is important, but it's the destination, that end goal of seeing the beauty in the chaos around us that is important. And where do we start? Well, perhaps a hint comes from chapter 10 of Luke. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, this would not have been an entirely new concept to the disciples, since nearly half of the Ten Commandments mandate various aspects of good behavior towards one's neighbor, not coveting, not bearing false witness, etc. You know the ones I mean. And you can picture the disciples contemplating this, mentally surveying their neighbors. Oh yes, Joseph at number three. Yes, I can love him. Hard worker, his wife's a good cook, kids are always respectful. And Levi, across the road, good man always willing to let you bore his donkey when yours is in the shop. 
yes, I can love him. And they're feeling pretty comfortable with the whole love thy neighbor notion. And then someone has to ask, a lawyer perhaps, <clears throat> wanting further clarification on the whole thing before he's ready to commit, wants the whole concept of neighbor better defined. Hang on, who is my neighbor? Now I have no idea why in my head disciples always sound like Monty Python, but they just do. And in answer to that question, the parable of the Good Samaritan unfolds. And you're familiar with the story. The Good Samaritan got it. He lived his life as an example of radical compassion, able to recognize beauty and the intrinsic value in everything around him, and he acted accordingly. How does the ability to see beauty in all around us, as God does, affect our interaction with our fellow humans on this planet? When through whatever contempl contemplative path you choose to take, that recognition is achieved, then how do you not act? The Samaritan recognized the need. He recognized this person, ignored and overlooked by many, as a literal and metaphoric traveler on the road, a neighbor. And he saw through God's eyes the value and beauty of that man. And when you can see the beauty all around us, truly recognize the call of the divine, even in the dirty, broken roadside experiences of life, that's when we do, like the Good Samaritan, begin to live lives of radical compassion. God has already deemed his creation to be very good. So why are we, who are we to create critique otherwise. Like that cedar in Lebanon, remember the one in Ezekiel? By living lives of radical compassion, we too can protect and nourish and comfort those around us, because our roots too are deep and strong in God's sustaining and all-encompassing love. Amen. <laughs>
During this time of prayer, if you would like to share a prayer of concern or thanks for yourself or someone in a situation in the world, please type the prayers into the comments section at any point so that all the others watching can share them and hold them up to God. This time of prayer invites us to an eyes open experience of looking around. Trying, try keeping your eyes open as we pray. Look around and find something to focus on. It may be a detail that you rarely see or something that you see often that you, uh, but let your gaze wander during the prayers as a way of giving thanks for these surroundings. Let us pray. Oh God, who always listens to us, who breathes new life into us, call us forward to resurrection. We are surrounded by a world of need, a world of despair, a world where we lose hope in our structures and systems. We pray for this world in need of your word, for all the people in it, for those who lay down their lives, for those who lead. O oh God, who will always listen to us, who breathes new life into us, call us forward to renewal. We are surrounded by people unable to see your life past their tears. We pray for this world in need of your healing presence, for those who are imprisoned or alone, those ill or in pain or grieving. We pray for our church. We pray for the courage not to just follow you towards justice, healing, and love for all, but to be leaders also. Call us to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. On behalf of our Northminster community, we thank you for your generosity as you continue to be faithfully, excuse me, to give faithfully to the present and future ministry of the congregation. Thank you for the gifts that you drop off at the church, the donations made through our website, and to those who give through PAR and tithely. Let us bless all the expressions of faith. Let us pray. Holy One, it is a privilege to share in your mission, and we continue to adapt and be responsive to the ever-changing needs around us. We ask your blessing on these gifts and the gift that is this faith community, that they may be in service to human kindness, comfort and understanding, great hope and unending love. Amen. Thank you for worshiping together with us this morning. We continue to be the church in all the ways that are possible. Do read our weekly emails from the church so that you know how to we can support you and how you can keep in touch. Our blessing. This world is so varied and beautiful. Seek wisdom wherever it's found. And may the goodness of the Creator, the companionship of the Christ, and the insight of the Spirit infuse your life now and always. Amen. Peace be with you. And as we end our time of worship, enjoy this video and be in awe of God's creation. Bye for now. <laughs>